Good afternoon. So we're, uh, we're into the last two weeks of class here. We're going to power through a few more of these vibration sections. Um, so the next, the next topic is we're going to continue to focus on um, this simplest of vibration modes, which was the free undamped vibrations where we have a mass and a spring constant. Um, but it's, we're going to do a little bit of a twist today. And the twist is we're not going to deal with just a straight mass and a linear spring. We're going to talk about um, the pendulum, which um, fundamentally actually behaves very much the same way in terms of its oscillations. So the idea is how do we, how do we analyze, I mean we did this problem at the very end of the momentum section, right? Where we said there was a rod that was swinging back and forth, it oscillated, it gave us you know, a result of a positive and a negative answer. Um, and it really indicated to us that there was an oscillatory behavior to this motion. The question now is how do we use what we've just developed for mass and spring and apply it to this oscillatory motion of a pendulum? So you've got to think very carefully about the way that you draw this free body diagram and how you set up something like an equation of motion. So in the mass and spring system, remember that the mass starts at this equilibrium point and it goes to the left and to the right of that equilibrium point where the x being positive and negative, that actually matters in its direction. So, so how, do we, how do we measure displacement of a pendulum as it's bobbing from left to right? The way we do that is we define an angle, our theta angle, and we specifically say that the equilibrium position when nothing is, or, or when the pendulum is not going left and right. The equilibrium position is when it's, when it's hanging straight down, and that is our theta is equal to zero position. Okay, so that is our neutral position, just like before. When the mass is brought to the left, we consider this to be actually a negative angle. So the idea is this direction of rotation is our theta is positive, which means that if the, if the string goes this way, this is our theta is negative. Okay? So just like in the mass and spring, we have to define very carefully which one is our positive, which one is our negative. Okay? Okay, so if we do that, the next step is let's establish our free body diagram. So our free body diagram would look like this. If, the, if theta is to the left, so theta is less than zero, it's negative, here's what you would expect. You would see our mass the pendulum with a tension force of the rope going up this way. So here's our T. And then we would see that there is an MG that's straight down. And the way to think about this MG is that typically we like to break it up into two component forces. And in this particular motion, it's traveling in this circular arc you should really be thinking of it in terms of the un and ut directions, the normal and tangential components. So if I do this, if I say this is my typical un vector, when the bob is going up this way in the negative direction, this is kind of like my, this is my ut, right? ut goes up that way. And I can break up my mg vector into an mg, this is like an mg cos theta, where this is theta. And this one right here is my mg sine theta. Okay? All good, right? All makes sense? Okay, so it's pretty clear to me that the, the tension and the mg cos theta, that's going to be your sum of forces in the normal direction. But the force that really matters in this particular case, the force that is similar again to the mass and spring in the linear direction of the x, it's all really due to this mg sine theta. And the way you want to write that is you want to say, well, the sum of the forces in the tangential direction must be equal to my mAT. And remember, AT, anytime you're doing tangential acceleration, we already know that. That has to actually be the second derivative of your displacement, right? So we know for sure that this mAT must be equal to what? It should be an m. And then if you look carefully at your AT, and compare it to your AR, A theta uh, directions, 
we can write at as this, right? R theta double dot. Okay? Basically, your alpha r, right? Your alpha r, and alpha, when we write it in terms of theta, theta double dot. So our m r theta double dot should then be equal to what? It should definitely be equal to the mg sine theta, but opposite in the direction of, of ut. OK? So the, the negative sign pops out here. Remember, when this mass is on the left-hand side, theta is negative. mg sine theta is opposite the direction of that theta. If I redraw this, uh, this free body diagram and I draw it on the, on the right-hand side, picture this. The tension force is going to be up this way. Theta is going to be greater than 0. mg still straight down. But guess what happens to my mg sine theta? My mg sine theta now goes this way. right? And mg sine theta is still, again, opposite direction of my, my theta, which is greater than 0 in this case. It's, it's there to restore the pendulum back to its equilibrium position. Okay. So picture this. I'm going to rewrite this equation. This equation is going to be written as the following. So, so r, my r theta double dot r, by the way, is equal to my L in this problem. All right? So the, the r is the distance from the, the axis of rotation to the mass itself. So r is equal to my. to my L. So I'm going to rewrite this. It's going to be m L theta double dot. And I'm going to move the m g sine theta onto the other side. And it's going to be equal to 0. Okay, And this becomes our differential equation that we should solve for theta. So solve this differential equation. for theta of t, just like we normally do for x of t and y of t. Okay. So does anyone know how to solve this, this ordinary differential equation? It's really, really hard, actually. The problem is this sine theta here. Right? It's almost like saying, well, now you have to have a function, a theta of t, where if you take two of its derivatives with respect to time, somehow it turns out that it's going to be equal to a sine function. That's not at all the same as our x double dot plus x, our other ordinary differential equation. So how do we go about this? So one is if you want the real accurate exact solution, you actually have to solve this either numerically or with some really uh, complicated elliptical integral of some sort. So it's not an easy thing to do. The easiest thing that we're going to try to do here is to approximate it. And we're going to approximate it by making an assumption. So here's our assumption. Apply to cases where theta is really, really small. Okay. So we want really, really small angles. Okay. So not a 30 degree angle the way that I've drawn it on the board, or, or, or 20 degrees even. How small should be small? Well, we want it to be so small that the sine theta actually approximates theta. So if we can prove that sine theta can be approximately theta in radians, then we have the following. Then we have a much more familiar ml theta double dot plus mg, and we replace the sine theta with just the angle itself, mg theta is equal to 0. OK, so that's much more, that's much more familiar to us. Right? We can definitely do a differential equation that's a theta double dot and a theta. What angle is really small enough that sine theta and theta are the same? So as it turns out, if I might get, I can give you a quick table of these values here. So if I do theta in degrees, theta in radians, 
And let's look at the value for sine theta. So here's what happens. If we do theta is 0, 0 radians, sine of theta is just 0. Okay. But let me do this. Let me just do four of these. So let's say we do 1 degree, 2 degrees, 5 degrees, and 10 degrees. If I converted it into radians, so it would typically multiply by pi over 180, here's what I get for values. So 10 degrees is 1745. Okay? Now, you take the sine of this degree, or this, uh, this, this angle in radians, and here's what you get. Okay. We actually get pretty close. Even up to about 10 degrees or so, our error in the actual value of sine theta, if we just approximated it as theta, Let's say the error is about 0.5%. Pretty good. I'll even go up to 20 degrees just to see, just to see how far we can go here. So this would be 0 0.34907 radians. And this now is a bit more of an error, 0.34202. So this is now, this is more of a 2% error. Okay, so that's actually pretty good. The fact that we can approximate to 2% error that sine theta is pretty much just like theta if you stay within less, uh, stay less than 20 degrees, it's pretty good. So let me finally do our, our solution here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that ordinary differential equation and I'm going to do some more rearranging. So we're going to rearrange. Okay, and it looks like one of the m's cancel. So I'm going to get the following, theta double dot plus g over l theta is equal to 0. Okay, so our new form is this differential equation, and we know right away that it then must satisfy our typical sines and cosine solution. Therefore, the solution is going to simply be theta in this case, because we're dealing with just the angle. We're going to say this is our same a sine omega nt plus b cos omega nt, right? Or if you like, our new alternative solution, which is a capital C amplitude times a sine omega nt plus a phase shift. Right? Either of these will work. Okay, and now what are we interested in? We're interested in seeing what exactly is natural frequency, the meaning of natural frequency for a pendulum. So this omega n here, what does that equate to if the formula is like this for our differential equation? This used to be, remember, a k over m, right? So basically, we want the form. We want to write this, omega double dot plus omega n squared theta is equal to 0. So if you just replace omega n with the square root of g over l, gravitational acceleration and the length of the rope for the pendulum basically gives us the natural frequency of the pendulum. Quick check of units here. So meter per second squared, a meter square root. So sure enough, that's radians per second, right? OK, all good. OK, any, any questions on that? Yeah, Leo. Yeah.
Yeah, I think, OK, so there's some confusion here about my theta use and an NT coordinates. Look, we've done this before, right? Kinematics in the two coordinate systems, N and T, R and theta, we've shown previously that if you're traveling in a circle, that it's really, really easy to convert U, R, U, theta to U, N, U, T, right? So just manage your signs and know how to, and know how to piece those together, right? OK, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing that we've dealt with before. OK, so here's what we're going to do. If this is our omega n and our g over l, this actually makes it a whole lot easy, uh, a very, very easy, I should say, um, to do some calculations on just how fast that frequency is and how to link that frequency to period. So I mean, I can, I can, I can develop this further, right? We know that a period, for instance, right, given my previous formula, 2 pi radians over that one full cycle divided by this natural frequency will give us the, the amount of time that uh, one cycle happens. Now I'm going to replace this omega n. I'm going to put down that this is 2 pi and flip the square root. So this will be 2 pi l over g. OK? And what's interesting about this is all I need to do is set up a pendulum where I've got my g, 9.81. I only need one parameter, the length of my string, and I can figure out a tau. Okay? And it seems to be a completely independent of mass because my mass got eliminated in this equation here. Okay? So let's do a quick little demonstration. Got, got a pendulum here, nice handy pendulum. So if I, if I hold my finger at one of these locations, let me measure, let me measure the length of this string where I'm going to hold it. See here, so I'm going to measure roughly from the center of mass of my mass. And I'm going to hold it right around this orange sticker here. So that's about 70, I'm going to say 74, 74 centimeters. Okay. So if you guys can do a quick calculation here for me, 2 pi square root of 74 centimeters, or 0.74 meters, divided by g. Take that square root. Tell me what you think this period should be for a single cycle of my little, of my pendulum here, my makeshift pendulum. Sorry? 1.73? 1.73 seconds? OK. OK, so let's try it, right? Now, now I'm not really good, and I, I think we're going we're gonna to run into issues here with, uh, with reaction times of a, hitting a finger with a timer, right? So let's do the following. If I multiply this by 10, OK, I would expect 10 cycles of my pendulum to be roughly 17.3 seconds. Everyone agree? If I, do 10, if I do 10 oscillations of this, OK? So can someone help me with a timer? Do you have a timer? Yeah? Someone bring out their iPhone, maybe? Let's see if I got this. OK, now, now you guys help me count. I'm going to make sure that my pendulum doesn't exceed my 20 degrees error, right? My 20 degrees, which is a 2% error, so like roughly like that. I'm going to let go, and we're going to count 10 cycles. And then we're going to see how close we get to this 17.3 seconds. I count for 70. What's that? I count it for 70 seconds. What do you, what do you mean you count it for 70 seconds? <laughs> Haven't started yet. OK. You want to start a timer? No, not yet. Just let me, let me I'll, I'll tell you when. I'm going to let go. All right, so I'll let go, and then you got to hit the button, okay? okay? And then when everyone counts to 10, we're going to say stop, and then you're going to stop the button, okay? Everyone counts to 10, I stop. We, we, yeah. Okay. When this thing hits 10, okay. I'm going to yell stop, okay. and you have to hit the button with as little reaction time as possible. Okay. Got it? Okay. okay, ready? All right, let's go. And now, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, I'm hypnotizing you, eight, nine, 
10. Stop. 17.24. Not bad. It's not bad, not bad, not bad, right? And the funny thing is, because it's independent of mass, I could be hanging a bowling ball at the end of this thing. Right? I don't have a bowling ball with me today. Right? But you can try this, and it works really, really well, um, independent of mass. Okay? OK, so any, any questions on that? OK, so that was the first twist today from our M and K, was to use a G and an L. But we're going to now step this up to the next level. Not only do we want to deal with particles that vibrate, we want to deal with rigid bodies that vibrate or oscillate. Right? So let's do the following. What if I did oscillations of rigid bodies? OK? So I'll do the same thing, but in this case, I'm going to use a slender rod. Let's start with a pendulum. So what if I swung a pendulum that was an entire slender rod? So clearly, it's not a particle anymore. The mass is not concentrated at the end. If I did the following, the diagram would basically look like this. Here's my slender rod. Here's my theta. Here's my g. And this is my typical, you know, my L, A, B length of the length of the slender rod, right? Okay. So what do we do? How do we do this analysis? What is our goal here? Okay, so hint, right? Our, our big goal is we need to get to an ordinary differential equation that looks like this. We have to have something in here that is going to be equated to our omega n squared. If we can achieve that, automatic solution, right? Your cosine and sine. So it's all about getting it into this particular form. The question is just how, okay? So if you look at that diagram, rigid body, rotating with a theta, which equation of motion is going to be most reasonable to use? f is equal to ma in x and y, in n and t. What do you do when something rotates as a rigid body? Yes? Yeah, let's do it. Sum of moments about a, i, a, alpha, right? What did I just say alpha was equal to in the world of thetas? Theta double dot. Correct. OK? So now let me just draw my free body diagram again. It's going to be like this. Here's my G point, right? And my G point tells me that I, I basically have an MG down from my, from my rod. But it's the same thing, right? I can break this up into, into two components. And clearly, I have a, an MG sine theta that's driving it towards the equilibrium position, that neutral point, OK? So any, any other forces acting on this? Well, there's some reaction forces here, perhaps, like an fx and fy. But pretty much the only force that generates a moment about a, this guy, right? And it's generating a moment about a with the negative sign. It's always, if it's a negative theta, it pulls it in the positive direction. If it's in a positive theta, it pulls it back in the negative direction. So this I A theta double dot, negative mg sine theta is the force multiplied by the moment arm, which is L A B over 2. OK? That's it. That's, it's as simple as that. All I did was I did moments, looked at all the forces that generated moments about A, and I equated it to I A theta double dot. Okay, so this is all before we get to the differential equation part. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take my IA, right? IA is end of a slender rod. So we're going to do a mass LAB squared. 
theta double dot is plus, and now I'm going to move this to the other side, mg lab2 sine of theta is equal to 0. Okay. We don't like the sine theta, at least not in this chapter of this course. So we're going to make this assumption, right? Only small angles in this course. Sine theta is approximately theta for small angles. Right? And we just went through a table of values where we can make that argument true. So I'm not going to replace my sine theta theta double dot plus mg lab over 2 theta. OK? So finally, I can do my magic and move everything into that term and figure out what my omega n is. So finally, we have theta double dot oops, plus m's cancel g over l. OK? So due to the fact that our pendulum changed from a mass that's a particle now to a rigid body, which is a slender rod, we get a new little constant here, a 3 over, a three over 2, which means our omega n then must be 3g over 2l square root. Pretty easy. Any any questions on that? No. Okay. All right. So that's and by the way, right? Once you're done with this, you're gonna you're gonna take your omega n and you're gonna gonna do this, right? You're gonna say c sine omega nt plus phi, and you're going to use initial conditions to get your c and your phi, and your results will be thetas, so everything is in radians, right? OK? OK, let's do another one. See which other one I have here. All right, let's do this one. OK, another rigid body. It's the big square disk, okay? A large square disk where this is a D, so the diagonal, half the diagonal of the square, and the square has sides A on both sides, like that. And so it says find theta of T. when displaced by small theta, OK? OK, so same principle. I'm just curious as to what changes with this number here, this 3 over 2, and, and just a little exercise in figuring out our, uh, our mass moments of inertia, really. Everything else should be the same, right? OK, so it looks to me like we can do the following. Let's do an ma is equal to ia theta double dot again. And it looks to me like our free body diagram is going to be negative mg. Uh, this case, uh, it looks like the moment's going to be happening around d, right? There should be a d sine theta like that. OK. So a couple of things here. D is just a, it's related to A, right? If this is A and this is A, then this line right here 
has to be root 2 times a, right? So if a full diagonal is root 2 times a, then d must be a full root 2 over a divided by 2. It's half of that, OK? OK, I also know that for a square, ig is going to be equal to a 1 1 12th m times, it's like a rectangle. You would always take the two legs, and it's basically an a squared plus an a squared. OK? You can look this up. It's, a, it's in tables. And for, for an exam, if we were to give you this, we'd, we'd give you this ig. OK? So that's our ig, basically a 1 over 6 m a squared. But we need m. We need IA because we've, we've moved our point that we're interested in for rotation to point A, which is a fixed point of rotation. So we're going to need parallel axis theorem. So here's our IA. IA is going to be IG plus MD squared. Okay, So 1 over 6 MA squared plus m, and d is just going to be that root 2a over 2 squared. So it'll be 2a squared over 4. So it's 1 half plus 1 6, 2 thirds. So 2 thirds m a squared and a theta double dot plus, now I'm going to put my m g d sine theta. OK, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm, just, I'm going to skip this line. We always know that our sine theta becomes a theta. So I'm just going to write that. Save, a, save ourselves some work here. Let's make a, make a little note, right? You know, sine theta is approximately theta for small angles, et cetera. And then I'm going to cross out my m's and get my theta double dot plus, it's going to be a g over a. Looks to me like there's a 3 root 2 over 4. And so omega n, square root of 3 root 2 over 4, g over a. OK, yeah, question. Where is sine theta on the diagram? Hmm, it would be like this. Uh, I would tilt my square like this. Like that, the G point would move up to here. This line is like that, and this is my theta. OK, so let me do that with a sheet of paper. It's basically like this. If that's the equilibrium position, I've rotated it like this. And so it swings like that. OK, and this is the line where you're measuring theta from the vertical. OK, do I have time for, let's do one more. And this one will be my last one.
All right. So here's typically what we're going to give you in assignments and, and exams. Now it's just a combination of everything. All right? Now we've got, we've got a mass and a spring, but I've made the mass and the rope drape over a large disk. It's basically like a flywheel. And this flywheel that has this rope attached to it or running along its edge, it's going to rotate with angle theta. And as it rotates, this mass is going to drop by an equivalent distance that's equal to this arc length. And the string is going to the spring is going to stretch. Okay, so the spring will stretch, the mass goes down, the disk rotates, everything's happening. There's rigid bodies, there's a particle. Okay, just the whole the whole works, right? Okay, and I just ask a very simple question: What is the natural frequency? Okay, so that's all I'm looking for is omega n. Are you able to do your force balances, do a little bit of a disruption of this theta angle, and then figure out that term that's in the middle of my differential equation, right? Okay. So it's rigid bodies. Okay, and I'm going to first note here the following, right? If this mass goes down by a y, like a y is equal to 0, so let me say uh, this is my y is equal to 0, right? Okay, so first thing first, always set up your neutral position so you know exactly where the datum line is for everything. If the mass is hanging straight down and you're measuring from y is equal to 0, Guess what happens? This is obviously theta is equal to 0, right? Theta is equal to 0. But as y increases, this y must be equal to an r theta. Okay? That's how those things would be related, because this is my, my radius capital R. Okay? What else do we know? We also know that in equilibrium position, this is kind of like a a y direction hanging spring, right? It's like the spring must already have a natural stretch position. Okay, so spring already naturally stretched. Ready stretched in the equilibrium position. Right? So how, how much is it stretched? We know that you can do the following. You can say sum of forces in the y direction for the mass. If everything is at equilibrium, there's no acceleration at 0. And the mass should be doing this, right? mbg, and then upward tension in the rope. But the tension in the rope is basically like a k times s, right? So this will be mbg minus the k times s. So this is a k times my, essentially my s, or like my, let's do a y pre-stretch. So the y pre-stretch is mbg over k. Exactly like what I showed you last class, it's an mg over a k, gives you how much the spring is already naturally stretched. OK, so next thing, the whole thing is rotating. So let's go about our typical business of trying to find mass moments about O and rotations about O. So this is like this, right? MO is IO alpha. It's the same as IO theta double dot. Okay. And so what are all of our what are all of our moments? So all the moments that act on this motion are going to be the MB that goes down. So this has to be like this, right? MBG multiplied by R. Okay? So that's the force that is on the, on the block, creating a moment about O. 
Okay? And what other forces are acting around point O that create a moment? It must be the spring force. The spring force is this Ky that acts in the opposite rotation. So if this one is acting to drive the disk this way, then Ky is acting to drive it the other way. So here's my Ky. Okay? But Ky, the, the total force must be Y plus the pre-stretch, right? So this has to be a K times Y plus Y pre, right? If you're confused about this, go back to the vertical spring section where I added that Y pre section. Okay, that's the force multiplied again by my moment arm. Okay, let that sink in for a little bit. Gets a little complicated, but hopefully you see that this one creates rotation this way, this one creates rotation this way, hence the minus sign. Okay, and then we got to figure out what this I/O is. So I/O is the one where right now it's we don't quite know what it is yet. It should be the mass moment of inertia of the disk, but because the whole system is the disk plus the hanging mass. You can't forget about the hanging mass that's a particle. So IO must be the following. 1 half M capital R squared, that's the disk, plus the hanging mass as if it was a particle. So it must be an M B R squared. A little bit more extra mass, and I should put a little D here, right? Okay. So mass of the disk, one half mass of disk r squared plus mass of the little block r squared away as if it was a particle. Okay? So this is the block as particle distance r away from O. Okay, so we can finally put this all together. Therefore, we have 1 half mdr squared plus mbr squared times a theta double dot minus m oops, is equal to mbgr minus ky. And then I'm going to add this y pre now in terms of a m, b, g, k times r. OK? So do you see what happened there? What happened there was, again, exactly what happened last class. Whatever was hanging down, creating a moment due to the block, this is being canceled out by the pre-stretch anyways. This k times divided by this k. That term actually goes away. All you're left with is really this. It's the total mass moment of inertia of the block, like that, plus a simple ky of the spring is equal to 0. And this y is what I wrote back there, where I defined it in terms of theta. 1 half mdr squared plus mbr squared theta double dot plus kr theta is equal to 0. OK? So I'll write my final solution here. One of the r's cancels out. Therefore, omega n is that right? Oops. Oops, sorry. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a second here. 
going a little too fast there. So this is a, sorry, this is a k times r, and the y is an r squared. So kr, this actually becomes an r squared. Here we go. And then these r squares all cancel out. That's better. And so we get 1 half md plus md. Yeah. I had to check myself there, right? Because I looked at the units, and then clearly they were wrong, because I had an extra r in there. So that clarifies it. OK, any, any questions on that? All the different elements coming together? Yeah. For which part is increasing? So as MD, let's, it doesn't increase, but like goes up and down. Yeah, but it doesn't change. So the question is, when MB goes up and down, does the R change for your MBGR? The answer is no, because the R is the perpendicular distance of the mass, right? So the moment arm has stays R, no matter no matter how far down it goes. Yeah. The mb r squared. OK, so think of this as the entire mass moment of inertia of the system, right? The IO was the disk, certainly, right? But anytime you have a particle, the particle's mass moment of inertia around a fixed point O, back to the particle section, is always mass times distance squared, mr squared, right? So re remember, remember your equation when we did our particles and we said uh, i of a particle is basically sum of m i r i squared. Remember that? So this is basically saying take all of your particles and just calculate m r squared and add them all together. That's how we got this integral in the first place, this mass moment inertia by integration, right? And this one is just the block. Yeah? OK, so the question is, why is r defined as r theta? Why is y defined as r theta? This stretch in the spring, how much this string is stretched in terms of y is exactly equal to arc length of this disk. So picture the rotation of this disk by an, an amount theta. Why do we want theta? Because our equation tells us we need a theta double dot. Okay, so everything is in theta double dot in theta, and how do we know theta is related to r, r theta is equal to y? It's because when this mass drops, this spring stretches that amount, this mass drops by that amount, and this arc length goes that by, by that amount. Okay, and one last question, I think, here. Okay, all right, good. If that's everything, then see you guys on Wednesday. <laughs>